Welcome to OPCC. Welcome to those of you joining online. When I say that, sometimes I feel funny because I don't know who's joining us online. But there are people joining us online because there's some people who come this morning that said they've been watching online for about a year, which is like always encouraging. You're like, well, there really are people watching online. So hello, everybody online. We're glad you're here. Glad uh, all of you are here this morning as well. We've been diving in um, to this series on hope. Like hope is so important, so incredibly necessary for us as believers to have hope. When we think about the resurrection, it is all about hope, that we hope in our own experience of a resurrection as Christ had, that we have the blessed hope of the resurrection is what we call it. And our world is in desperate need of hope. We look and watch the news and we can see clearly that what is happening in culture, where culture has drifted to, um, the only thing that will turn around uh, what's happening is is hope in what I say, like the, the church is the hope of the world. The body of Christ functioning out in society, doing what it's supposed to do. And so when we say the church is the hope of the world, I don't mean um, that when we come into this physical location, that that's the hope of the world. This place, this property where this particular church exists, what I mean is the church functioning as the body of Christ. And so this is a place where equipping of the body goes on, where challenge to the body, where teaching of the word goes on. And then the church, you guys are the body and you're, you're sent out. You're the hope of the world. Like, the entire world um, rests upon the body of Christ functioning and doing what it's supposed to do out in the midst of the culture. And sometimes we find ourselves in this strange place where we're at odds with the culture um, and there's these crazy debates going on and, and whether or not, like, the, it, it is a war, but I, sometimes I feel like we get sucked into the war in the wrong way. When really all we need to do is make sure that we're functioning in the power and demonstration of the Spirit and we're doing what the Lord has sent us out to do. And so when we think about that and think about hope and thinking about how to fulfill what it is that God has called each believer to do, is to go out and, and, and really share the gospel, uh, to be people who are um, teaching what Jesus taught in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, raising up disciples, making disciples that make disciples. How does one go about doing that? How does one go about getting motivated to engage in that? Well, it starts with hope. You got to have some hope stirred up on the inside of you um, that you hope in the Lord Himself. And so I think that if we start there and we go, okay, I'm a believer, I know Jesus, I want to walk out His calling for my life, how do I stir that up? Well, Paul says in Romans 15 13, sort of uh, been a theme for us the last few weeks as I shifted gears a little bit in this series, is for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Okay, so when Paul writes that, he is specifically referring to the scriptures as he knows them at this time, the Old Testament. The things that were written in the past have the ability to stir up hope inside of us because it takes that endurance and that encouragement and those two things, the byproduct of it is it stirs up and creates hope within the believer. Now, Peter was also an apostle, and he shares something very important about the Scriptures. So we look at the Scriptures, and there's a lot of debate in the world today. So people say, man, I don't know, like there's this, this vicious attack on the Bible that you can't trust it, that is written by men. This is what you'll hear people say. Man, the Bible was written by men. How can you believe that? Right? And they, they, they feel like they're being so wise Right, and just try to knock that um, stool they're standing on to elevate themselves right out from underneath them this morning because this is what the Word says about itself. Paul, the Apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, 20, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so 
According to this passage, the Bible itself is the word of God. So God has chosen language to communicate with us as people. We're the only creations that exist, the only species on the planet that has a developed language that involves reasoning and critical thought. Why is that? Because we are made in the image of God. We bear his image. And so he has chosen the vehicle of language to speak to us. And we look in the gospel of John, even as Jesus came, John describes him as the logos. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so through the word, God is writing down a story to a group of people of which he made a promise to one guy, Abraham, that he would make him into a, 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 a people of, like a nation of many people. He would make him into a nation, from one guy to a, an, you know, an established nation on the planet. And then he raises up prophets to reaffirm this promise over and over and over again. Now, this is very important, and that's what this passage of Scripture is referring to is that a lot of times these men are writing Scripture. So, so when a person says, well, oh, how can you trust that? That was just guys writing about God. They're not some guys that are sitting there going, well, I'm going to try to prove to the world the existence of God, and so I'm going to write these arguments down, and I'm going to record them, and I'm going to tell everybody um, these specific things. That's not what's happening. What's happening is a very powerful call is coming upon a man's life. He's feeling prompted by the Holy Spirit to live out some obedience. He starts living out the obedience, and oftentimes he is writing about the obedience, and he prophesies to the nation of Israel, not to the whole world, to the nation of Israel, about what God is calling to them to in obedience. And he doesn't even realize that he's writing the Bible, okay? The Bible is recognized by the church later in time as it looks back and it says, men, the things this prophet said actually came to be. And as we apply the things that this prophet taught to our lives, we see transformation beginning to happen inside of our lives. This book comes into my life. I read it, I apply it, and it brings power. The power of heaven falls on my life. And so therefore, the church recognized it and said, this one needs to be canonized. It goes into the collection we call the Biblios, the canon of Scripture. And this happens over a period of time, um, over thousands of years. Okay, so we get the Old Testament from the uh, Old Testament Judaism. We get the New Testament from the church being born. And we put the two together. We have the Old and New Testament, 66 books that make up the Bible. And they all have this message of this language of God communicating to people who he is, what he's like, what it means to follow him. And so as we are looking through that, what takes place is, um, is that we are understanding and reading and hearing the, the Word of God. And this is important because the Word of God is the key to unlock faith in your life. And at the end of the day, none of you, myself included, have anything to offer to God but faith. That's it. Zero. You say, well, wait a minute. What about my giving? If your giving is not done in faith, it's meaningless. Well, what about my serving? I come and I serve at the, uh, you know, I greet people when they come in. If that's done without faith, it's meaningless. At the end of the, like even in my preaching, when I, I this is something that's been very powerful for me in the, in the past uh, couple of years is just to realize I have nothing to offer to God but faith. That's it. I, I can't offer him anything. You say, well, wait a minute. What, how many people have you baptized? Doesn't matter. I still can't offer anything to God but faith. How many people have you discipled? Doesn't matter. How many people have you taught over the years? How many funerals have you preached? How many weddings have you done? Doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. It's just faith. It's my belief in who God is and what God is calling me to, and my willingness to walk out and step in, into obedience where God has called me, 
That's all I have to offer God. I can't offer him anything else. And that becomes my life as a living sacrifice as I believe the God who has called me into obedience. And so we can work and never have faith, but you could never have faith and not work. And a lot of times people work without faith, and that's just religion. It's self-righteousness, and it becomes performance-driven, and we start to look at the things that we're doing in our lives as the things that's pleasing to God instead of just recognizing the only thing that's pleasing to God is my belief in him and what he has said. And as I step into things, I have to step into them in obedience. Otherwise, I've brought humanness to this thing, and I've created uh, a religious experience that I'm trying to call godly. And so this... Unlocking faith is critical that we understand the word has the ability to do that for us. Now, how does that happen? Well, there's a process that we go through, and it's, um, it's really supernatural. So a while ago, we ended the worship, the house lights went dim, the video came up, and Corey said, hi, I'm Corey, right? And he proceeded to tell us about announcements. And it got real dark in here. I was getting my stuff together. That's my time to get up on the stage and get ready to preach. It's also my time to go, well, how many people actually made it to church today? I never look back, okay? I never look back. When, I, when, when worship starts, like <laughs> sometimes it feels like nobody's coming to church today. And you get up on the stage and like, whew, they made it, right? And so I get up here and the lights come on and I get to see who made it to, to church today. And so the room is illuminated. And all of a sudden, I could see the different faces, um, the different shirt colors. I could see all kinds of things because the room has been illuminated. When I'm in the Word, this is a celebration of Pentecost. What is Pentecost? Pentecost is after Jesus um, uh, ascended. He promised that the Spirit would come and fall on um, the, the uh, apostles and give them power and authority to be witnesses. And so on the day of Pentecost, um, the Spirit fell. And part of the role of the Spirit is really it's a personal discipler. That's what the, the Holy Spirit is. He convicts us of sin. Um, he, he teaches us the things in the Word. He reminds us of things we've learned and read. And he takes the Scripture and he turns the lights on for us. And so this is why the Scripture is so important and so vital for us that we recognize if we are the hope of the world, as believers, we are the hope of the world. The church is the hope of the world. We go out into the culture. We need the scripture illuminated for us, the lights turned on so that we can understand it. And then all of a sudden, this supernatural cycle takes place where my faith starts to grow. And it continues to grow. The more that it grows, the more illumination that happens in my life. Because Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And so the more that I have the light of the world being illuminated in my life, the brighter light I myself become. And ultimately, as we put all those lights together, they become the physical body of Christ on the planet. As he is no longer walking on the planet physically, he said that we are the body of Christ. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his mouth. We are his eyes. And so even in preaching, I'm proclaiming the truth that I find in the word that the Holy Spirit is illuminated in my mind and helped me to understand. I'm equipping the saints so that you might be sent out and encouraged through endurance of the stories that I'm learning from. And you go out and you're inspired to get in the word yourself. And the more hope that we create within us, then the more we will have hope coming out of us and the world itself will be transformed through our faith, okay? And so this takes place um, as a cycle. And this joy that, has, uh, that is a result of us being in the word gets us in this place where our faith is beginning to grow. Now, Jesus said this, okay? So taking a little time here, we see here I've established that what was written was written to create hope. I've established that what God has said about the word he said, it's not just men that wrote it, but they are, are men that wrote what I want as they were carried along by the spirit that I put in them. And so, so I'm going to establish today how that takes place and hopefully stir up some hope for you. Jesus said this in John chapter 5. Do not think 
I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So again, we see belief tied to what is written. And now Jesus is saying that Moses wrote about him. Now, what is Moses credited to writing? Well, Moses is like the man, okay? So we're not talking about a lot of times they're like, man, people, how can you believe? I, saw, I see some posts sometimes, and they make me a little angry. I'm saying, man, it's a fairy tale. And sometimes I think people think that some of the things that are written in the Bible, they don't understand these are real historical figures that we're talking about. Like Moses, the big Mo of the Old Testament. He is the prophet, okay, in Israel's history. But he is influential in our history. As a matter of fact, there are busts that surround the entire uh, United States House of Representatives, if you've ever been in there. And I've been fortunate enough to go there and, and tour it. And, and when you go in there and you look, you see all of these busts that are around the entire House of Representatives, but right behind the Speaker of the House, and I think all of the busts, you have to correct me, I may be wrong on this, but I think all of the other figures, and these are all people that his, historically have been in leadership, they're all looking toward the direction of Moses, but Moses is looking toward the direction of the Speaker of the House. And so it's, it's indicating that justice and, and right thinking and morality would happen. And so he, we're talking about a real guy here when we're talking about Moses. And he's had a real impact on um, the history of the world itself. And it's happened through this nation of Israel that goes back to this promise that came to Abraham who didn't have any kids. And he was told that he would have a kid and that kid, would, uh, that he would become the father of many nations. And so what is Moses talking about or what is Jesus talking about when he says Moses wrote about me? Because Moses was credited with the first five books of the Bible. We know them as the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Most Jewish kids growing up during this oral uh, society in this day and, and when it was written, they were required to memorize those books. <laughs> All of the kids were. And, and so it was a way that they passed down um, the, the, the history of who they were. And so we, we read those books, and they don't talk about Jesus. They don't talk about the gospel. They talk about the giving of the law, the leading Israel out of the uh, bondage of slavery, that they were held captive by the Egyptians. And they have these miracles of how God used Moses to deliver them from that captivity. And then God gives them all of these instructions about how he wants them to worship them as they actually have become the nation that was rooted in the promise that was given way back to Abraham, and now it is fulfilled. They're a nation without laws because they're released uh, from slavery. So they went, into, they went into Egypt as a group of 70. They came out in excess of a couple of, a mil couple of million, and now they're released from captivity. They were slaves. Now they're free. They have no organization. They just have Moses that is leading them as he is talking to God, and God is telling Moses what to do. And, and, and now here they are out in this place. They've crossed the Red Sea, and, and we pick up in this story um, in Exodus chapter 32. Now, here's what I want you to see. Remember when I said that in Peter, the, the gospel or the epistle of Peter, he says that, that, that the word of God for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What is taking place, I believe, about what I'm going to teach you from today is that Moses, I've, I think we find Moses writing about Jesus when he doesn't realize that he is writing about Jesus. He's being carried along by the Holy Spirit. It never had its um, origin in human will, but from God was speaking and, and carrying along men through the power of the Holy Spirit. So sometimes I'll preach a message. And then I'll just be right down in there, and I'm like, this is a good word. I'm excited about it. And I'm like, it's coming out, and I feel real good about it. And like, it's done, and we're over. And, 
and I'm standing at the back, and somebody will come up to me, and they'll say, hey, you know, you, you started talking about this, and I just want you to know that I saw this, and I, like, I'd never heard that, and that impacted me in such a, a profound way, and, and, and they start talking to me, and I'm sitting there scratching my head and going, I never even had that thought. Like I never, like they're talking about something that the Lord said to them that I, it came out of my mouth. I didn't recognize it, and I'm not elevating it, okay, to, the, 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 to what happens with Moses. But what I'm saying is sometimes as I'm carried along by the Spirit, God speaks to some of you guys about things that I'm not even thinking about. Even so much so that after you share what God said to you in that moment, I walk away thinking, you just taught me something, right? So I'm carried along. Moses is writing about stuff. He doesn't know that he's writing about Jesus in this moment in time. And that becomes very, very important as we deal with this argument of people saying, how can you trust the Bible? It was written by men. How can you trust it? I'm going to show you exactly how you could trust it. As a matter of fact, I think when I'm done today, it takes a whole lot more faith not to, to say that I don't believe it than it does to say that I believe it. Like you have to have a lot of faith. If it, when you really get this stuff, you have to have a lot of faith to be an atheist. I don't have enough faith to do that, right? I got enough faith to believe in Jesus, but I do not have enough faith to, to be an atheist. Okay, so here, here we go. Is that in Exodus chapter 32 through 34, let me break this down for you because I'm not going to read the whole thing. There's a bunch of scripture. You can sit with the Lord this week and read it yourself. I am going to paraphrase some of it. But Exodus kind of gets slow after chapter 20. Like up to chapter 20, you're reading the book of Exodus, man, and all these cool things are happening, all this miracles and stuff. But when you get to chapter, um, after you get to chapter 21 through 31, we get these instructions. And they're instructions about how you're to build this uh, tabernacle, this temporary dwelling of God where he would, the people would worship and sacrifices would be made and so on and so forth. And so we get all of these instructions. And then um, we see in uh, cha uh, chapters 35 through 40, more instructions. So 21 through 31, we have instructions on how to build the tabernacle. 35 through 40 are how to use the tabernacle. They almost sound exactly the same. Like they're, if you read them, like, I just, didn't I just read this? Isn't that the same thing? And they're very, very similar. One is about the building, what's to go in there. And then the second part is about how to use a lot of that stuff. And they're, they're both about worship. Well, then we have there in the middle, chapters 32, 33, and 34. So we have three chapters in the middle. These three chapters um, are, are very important. And we know this because, as I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, in Jewish uh, literature, the way they would write is the middle always becomes an important spot. A lot of times climaxes happen in the middle, not at the end, like we normally do when we're writing something. And so here we have in the middle that is bookended by proper worship, proper worship. This is how you worship God, this is how you worship God. Here are these three chapters in the midst of the middle. And in this particular passage of these three chapters, um, we have the story of Moses receiving um, the actual Ten Commandments historically recorded that they were written by the finger of God, somehow miraculously. So they get out of Egypt. They've crossed over from the Red Sea. They're there, and God calls Moses up the mountain. Moses goes up the mountain. Moses has been up the mountain for like 40 days. The people are down below. They're getting stir crazy. They're wanting to do something to honor God. But Moses, their leader, is not around, and they're not willing to wait on Moses. And, and so they get stirred up, and they start talking to um, Aaron, who is serving as a priest for them. We need some way to honor God. Moses is up there talking to God, getting the instructions that he's going to bring back down, and the people become so impatient, they, they talk Aaron into fashioning this image of God that um, he tells them, bring all your gold and bring your ornaments and bring them to me, and, and he melts them down and he fashions them into a calf, and they all celebrate, and they really, like this is a scary part, folks, they really are worshiping the God who got them out of Egypt. They're just doing it how they decide they want to do it instead of how God says to do it. 
That's the culture we're living in right now, is that people think it doesn't matter how you worship God just as long as you do worship God. That's not right, because these guys were trying to worship and celebrate the God who just got them out of slavery, but they were doing it in the way that they desired. They were not waiting on God. So they fashioned this uh, golden calf, and they decide to have a feast, and the Bible describes it as um, that they ate and they drank and they engaged in all kinds of revelry. And so there was a lot of godliness in it. There was a lot of truth in it, but there was a whole lot of stuff that was disobedient as well. And so Moses is up there. He's meeting with God. God is laying out all these things. And then God says to Moses, he begins to inform him of what's happening down at the bottom of the mountain. And he says, I'm, Moses, I'm going to destroy these people, and I'm going to start over with you. Now, we read that on the surface, and we go, man, how could God have that? Why would God say he's going to destroy the people? God knows he's not going to destroy the people. He's omniscient. He already knows what's going to happen. He's recording a story through Moses to teach us something. Remember, everything that was written in the past was to teach you through the endurance and the encouragement that we find in those stories, they create hope in us. And so as we're reading this story, God is preserving something for us. This is not so much about God changing his mind and Moses talking him out of it because Moses pleads with him and he says, oh God, like if, if you do that, then what will the Egyptians say that you just brought us out here, out into the wilderness to destroy us yourself? And so God, Moses is in this conversation with God, and, 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 and God says that he will not um, destroy them, but he says, you need to go down and deal with them. And so Moses comes down off the mountain, and he is ticked. I mean, he's upset, man, because when he comes down, he's, Joshua is kind of hanging out somewhere on the mountain. He's down mid-level, maybe. He didn't get to go all the way up. And he comes down, and Joshua says, um, it's the sound of, of victory that I hear in the, in the camp. And Moses says, that's not the sound of victory, bro. That's the sound of defeat. And, and they go down, and man, this, this, this thing is going on down there. And Moses takes the two tablets that God had given him and created, and he smashes them uh, against the idol. And then he starts to rebuke the people and tell them how disobedient they've done, been to God. And there's a lot of judgment that falls in that moment. Uh, th these are God's people, okay? These are God's people that judgment is falling on them. And as that judgment falls on them, um, then we see that uh, because of the, the actions of Moses, he deals with Aaron, the priest, and Aaron makes all these excuses. He's like, well, man, like the people started coming to me, and I put all their gold ornaments together. I threw them in the fire, and this calf just, boop, showed up. <laughs> so I like what people do when they're dealing with, with stuff in their lives. When they're dealing with disobedience, they want to try to find excuses for why it happened. When the fact of the matter is, it's their own their own behavior that brought about um, the golden calf in, in this situation. And so Moses tells the people, I'm going to seek the removal of your sins. I'm going to, I'm going to try to get atone, God to atone for your sins. And so death, so, so Moses has this discussion with God, and this whole idea of death is discussed, and, and, in, um, and, and it's in relation to Moses seeing God. Because when he's in this conversation with God, he says, I want to see your face. And God tells Moses, nobody can see my face. He says that, um, but I'll tell you what, there's a, there's a hole in the rock, in the cleft of the rock. You can get in there. I will cover you, and I will pass by, and you can see my glory as I walk away. And so they agree to that. It happens. God gives Moses a second copy of the law that he is to write himself. When he gets the second copy of the law, he is allowed to see God walk away and he comes out transformed from the experience. So he receives the second thing, okay? And then he is transformed. He appears before God's people in a transformed state with a new copy of the law written by him at God's direction. What we have here is a telling of the gospel through the greatest leader of Israel's history. Now, I'll show you what I mean. This is amazing. But there are five verses that don't seem to fit. You're reading down through there, and you get chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. You could skip these verses, and the whole section, the three chapters, would actually read better. 
And it leads one to ask ourselves the question, is this a mistake? And the answer is no, it is God. Because what we have here in the middle of the middle is a beautiful story. It's the tent of meeting. Now Moses, so he comes down from the mountain. This is when this is going on, when he is having this conversation with God about coming up the mountain again. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. And anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. And as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud, which was a representation of God, would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. And whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped each at the entrance to their tent. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Now, again, he is not seeing God in all his glory. God's represented by the cloud, but he's speaking to him as if um, he's having a conversation that he would have with another human being. And the tent of meeting is not the tabernacle. Stay with me, folks, because this is like, boop, like it's here in a second. I'm going to drop a truth bomb on you, okay? The tent of meeting is not the tabernacle. It's outside the camp. And it's a place of intimate worship that Moses set up outside the camp so he would not have any distractions and he could go meet with the Lord. And when, goes, when Moses would go in there, the people would worship from their own tents. And when Moses would leave, he would, he would take Joshua with him. And it says, when Moses would leave, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave. Now, what the heck is that about? Why is that even in this passage of Scripture about all of this stuff? Well, it's, it, it, it is connected to um, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. And this is something that is repeated over and over in Israel's history. And this is a prophecy about the Messiah. In Deuteronomy 18, 15, it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites, and you must listen to him. This is a prophecy about the Messiah that would come. This is a prophecy about Jesus. And so all of the Israelites grew up all of their lives memorizing the Pentateuch, knowing that one day God would raise up a prophet that was like Moses that would help them like no other prophet would. And so there was never a prophet like Moses until we get to Jesus. And so when Jesus comes, what does Jesus do? Jesus says, I'm the one that Moses talked about. And so he's saying that Moses wrote about me. But there are also other layers in the midst of this. And, and so these people are growing up always anticipating that the Messiah would come. And, and then we see that Joshua followed Moses. And, and Joshua led the people into the promised land. Jesus leads us into the promised life. It's, first of all, it says, there's, there's three things about this, this verse. One, it says young aid. It's weird that it puts that in there. His young aid, Joshua. Why is that in that passage of Scripture? It is to connect with, I believe, when Jesus starts his ministry. This would have been about the age of 30 years of age, is what they would call a young aid, would be about 30 years of age. Jesus started his ministry at 30 years of age. He was crucified at 33. The second thing we see is Joshua. Joshua is the Hebrew equivalent of Jesus. Okay, young aid, Jesus, he's the son of Nun. Names are extremely important in the Bible. They always are. Nun means eternity. Jesus, son of eternity, stayed in the tent. Moses is making intercession for the people inside the tent. Jesus, son of eternity, stays in the tent. Moses has no idea he's writing about Jesus in this moment. He's writing about actually literally what happened. But God has every idea that he is writing about Jesus. You see, right here in the middle of the middle of this section that is bookended with instructions about proper worship, we find a message, Jesus, son of eternity, never leaves the tent. 
He's constantly making intercession. And it's right in the middle of the middle section that tells us this is something extremely important. And so when we look at Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 through 25, but because Jesus lives, what, forever, he has a permanent priesthood, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So even in this moment, as I preach the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ is interceding on my behalf. He constantly lives to intercede for me in order for me to be spared of the judgment of God. And why does he do that? Is it because I'm a preacher? Is it because I give? Is it because I serve? It's because I believe that Jesus is the son of eternity that stays in the tent to make intercession on my behalf. It's my faith. That's it. And so as we, we begin to think about, well, what is God calling me to in this? What does this mean? He always lives to intercede for us just like Moses was interceding on the people, for the people. But interestingly, Jesus has something to say about proper worship. You remember, there's an experience. He's walking with the disciples. He's going back to Jerusalem, and he says, we're going to go through Samaria. They didn't want to go through Samaria. They hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans were half Jewish and half something else, all right? And they, 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 even, they were racist toward them. The Jewish people were racist toward the Samaritan people and the Samaritans likewise. And the, the Jewish people would call the Samaritans half-breeds, and it was, it was just an awful experience uh, between the two. And so when they were going to Jerusalem, the uh, the Jews had a route that they would go all the way around Samaria. They wouldn't go through it, even though it was a shorter route. And so Jesus says to his disciples, as they're heading back to Jerusalem, we have to go through Samaria. And when he gets there, they, they come up on this well. If you've been in church much, you've heard this story before, but maybe this is your first time uh, to hear it. But there's this woman, the disciples go on into town to, do, to get some things to eat because they're, they're hungry. So Jesus sends them into town. This woman makes her way in the middle of the day, and she's going to draw water, which was not typical for a, a woman to do during that uh, period of time because it's the heat of the day. You would do this in the morning, and you needed the water uh, uh, all day, so you wouldn't come in the middle of the day. She's coming because she doesn't want to deal with the crowd. She doesn't want to deal with uh, what people say about her because she doesn't have the best reputation. And so she comes in the middle of the day, and, and Jesus is there sitting on the well. And Jesus begins to talk to her, which was uncommon for any Jew to do, for any Jew to talk to a Samaritan was uncommon. It was exceptionally uncommon for a Jewish man to talk to a Samaritan woman. And she even points that out to him. And he begins to initiate a conversation about the water that's in the well and how he has living water. And he's talking to her and she's kind of having some small talk a little bit with him. And all of a sudden through this conversation, I don't, I'm not going to uh, unpack the whole thing. You can read that too. But, but as in the conversation, Jesus begins to point out all kinds of sin in her life. This woman had been with five different uh, men and the woman that she, she was um, uh, shacking up with at this point in time wasn't her husband. And Jesus Jesus points that out to her. And in the midst of him pointing that out to her, she knows she's found out. She says, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and the truth. And the woman said, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. She's basically quoting Deuteronomy 18. I know that there's going to be a prophet who's going to come and fix all of this mess. And then Jesus declared to her, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. He basically says, I am Jesus, the son of eternity, and I have come to help you worship right. Book ended in the Old Testament. Worship, worship, in the middle, we find in the middle of the middle, 
verses that don't seem to fit that were written by a man 1,436 years before Jesus was born. Moses writes, Jesus, son of eternity, doesn't leave the tent. He makes intercession for the people. Moses doesn't even recognize that he's writing about intercession for the people as he talks God, talks to God about making atonement for their sins and sparing them. And Moses, and God says to Moses, I will not judge these people because of my relationship with you. Over and over and over and over again, we see the gospel poured out in the Old Testament. <laughs> and we look at that and we go, like, what is God saying to us? When it comes to the word, here it is. God is the author, the prophets are the pens, and we're the proclaimers. And if you are not proclaiming, you're missing the whole reason for your existence as part of the body of Christ. And so we look at this and we go, man, how do I become one who proclaims the truth? There's only one way that this can happen. The only way that it can happen is that we begin to believe it. We have to believe it. Like we have to, we have to wrap our minds and go, listen, if I told you I had something that you could read and it would tell you exactly how you could go out and make a fortune next week. And, 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 and you believe me, you would go out and buy the book and you would begin to memorize it front and back. It would become the most precious thing to you. It would be kind of like in the movie Back to the Future when that one, the one dude that gets manure dumped on him all the time, he's got the book from the future, right? And it's the most precious thing to him. The whole movie is about that book. And you, if, 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 if I could tell you something like that and say, man, you can make a fortune. It would be the most precious thing to you and you would study it and you would use it and you would start to see that it is true and the things that I've told you are creating wealth in your life and you'd be so happy and you'd be like, look at all the power that I possess. I'm telling you, you have the truth. Like this is the only thing that will make you a proclaimer. This is the only thing that will teach you how to make disciples. This is the only thing that will, it will help you to have hope in your life. Is you see, the more of it you get into and the more of it that it, it, the, the Holy Spirit illuminates your mind, the more you will believe. And the more that you believe, the more you'll want to get into it. And the more that you get into it, the more that you'll believe until ultimately you start proclaiming it. Some of you don't even know if you're supposed to preach the gospel like I'm preaching it from a platform right now. We are all the, to be preachers of the gospel, but some of us are called into full-time ministry. You want to know how I fi figured out that I was supposed to be a full-time minister of the gospel? Is I got in the word, I kept getting so much of the word in me that it started coming out. The first time that I ever preached a sermon, I preached it to a Rottweiler in my house by myself. And I was shocked that it came out of my mouth. How did it come out of my mouth? It got into my heart. I believed it. I sat with the Lord. He illuminated it for me. And the more I believed it, the more I, I wanted more of it. And the more of it that I got, the more that I believed. And it just kept growing. And, and even to this, this day, I'm preaching a sermon to you. And I look at that and I go, how could you say that men wrote this when it has such harmony? How does, like, this, this, tell me this. How does Jesus get Mary and Joseph to name him Jesus? 1,436 years before, it was prophesied that the prophet would come. How, how, does, how, does, like, how does Jesus create the rumor before he's born that he was born of a virgin, that he had no father. How did, how, did he get that? how did he get them to do that? How does one, before you are conceived, get everybody to make up a rumor about you before you're born? And then have a prophet 400 years before prophesy that that's exactly what would happen out of the town of Bethlehem. How did he get to his parents to go to Bethlehem to be born? He didn't. His parents shouldn't even have been in Bethlehem. The only reason that they were in Bethlehem is because a person that was not a believer instituted a census, um, and, the, and, 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 and so all of the people had to travel to different places, and they had to go to Bethlehem in order to be able to be counted. And where was Jesus born? Right there in a stable. <laughs> 
What? And you go, ah, how can you believe the Bible? How could you be so foolish to reject it? Like, that's, that's my question for the people of the world that reject it. And so why do I, like, why am I leaning in so much? Because this church cannot be what it is supposed to be until we are all true worshipers. But when we become true worshipers who worship the Lord in spirit and truth, then all of a sudden, man, we are sent out into the world. And I want to stir up hope in you. I want to send you out. I want you to be equipped. And I want you to have the hope of the world in your heart. And I want you to be a proclaimer of all that God is doing, not all that God has done. What's he doing in your life? And the only way to have God do something in your life is to believe he's going to do something in your life. And as you're in the word, man, that cycle will start. And the more of it you consume, the more of it you want, the more of it you see happening, and you become a letter. <laughs> this is what Paul says. You, you see, the first covenant was smashed, and the second covenant came. It's the same thing that happens over. There's another parallel. The old covenant is gone of the law. The new covenant of grace is here. The, uh, uh, the, the old covenant is written in the letters. The new covenant is written on our hearts. And so God has given us a heart of flesh that he can write on, and we become a letter of the gospel as we live our lives. And that's, that's what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian doesn't mean you go to a church and you just listen to sermons. Being a Christian doesn't mean you give. Being a Christian means you believe, you believe what the word says and who Jesus is, and you walk that out. This is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the truth of the word. Thank you for the power of the word. Thank you for its encouragement. Thank you for how it gives us hope. We're blown away by it, Lord. I'm blown away by the word. And I pray that you would help me to never be in a position where I'm not blown away. Like keep teaching me, Holy Spirit. Keep discipling me. Keep helping me walk out the truth that you've called me to. May I have ears to hear and eyes to see so that I can do what you've called me to do. With every head bowed and every eye closed, man, we're gonna take communion the elements are there in front of you. My encouragement to you today would be just to be the, just to sit and think about yourself as the hope of the world. And when you, when you take that bread and you crush it in your mouth, that you be reminded that it was the body of Christ that was broken so that you could be a part of the body of Christ. When you drink the juice, that'll be a reminder of the blood that was shed so that your sins could be washed away and that blood could be the source of your life. And, and, and in those two things, when you, like when you eat that bread and when you drink that juice today, would you recognize that you are the hope of the world? You're the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. You are the hope of the world. And as we together go out into the world, that's the only hope for our culture. The answer is not gun control. The answer to gun violence is the church. The answer to rape is the church. The answer to poverty is the church. Who is the church? You are the church. You're the hope of the world. And so as you go out, like, can you partake of those elements? Be reminded today, be encouraged. I'm the hope of the world because I know Christ. And all I have to offer him is faith. And if I will believe that I am the body of Christ here on the planet, he will use me to make a difference in those around me. Lord, we love you. We pray for your blessing upon communion today. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>